gives me great pleasure now to introduce our inaugural lecturer for the Rosemary Crompton Memorial Lecture Series. Professor Eric Golden Wright from the University of Wisconsin Madison was the organizing committee's unanimously preferred speaker for multiple reasons. And as many of you will have the most fortune to know, it can be very difficult to get a group of academics to agree on anything. <laughs> um, for those of you in the audience who are unfamiliar with our speaker, he is an internationally regarded expert on class, Marxist theory, and social inequalities, and has been for several decades. In the three minutes I have, I can just about give you a very brief flavor of his work and the extent of his contributions to the discipline. Um, in his current volume, he examines the full range of non-Marxist class analysis and offers a virtue-centered critique of it. The aim here is not to simply, insofar as it's ever simple, <coughs> demolish non-Marxist thoughts on class, its origins, definitions, and utilities, um, but rather the aim is to describe it and identify what is useful, virtuous within it. So we are provided with a work which critically synthesizes the state of play in current sociological class theory. In another body of work entitled Real Utopias, um, he offers a diagnostic and a critique of capitalism. This body of work is in some ways also a group project, given the exhibition with key writers in each of the fields it touches upon, producing six volumes and counting under its theme, as far as I could establish. Um, in Real Utopias, um, Eric Olin Wright presents us with, and I paraphrase, the contours of an alternative social world that embodies emancipatory ideals and social innovations which we can create. It starts with a foundational proposition that many forms of human suffering and many deficits in human flourishing um, are the result of existing institutions and social structures. And he calls upon us to transform these institutions and social structures to reduce the aforementioned human suffering and expand the possibilities for human flourishing. The output of this project presents us with clear <coughs> strategies for generating these real utopias. He has published multiple times in the top academic journals in our discipline. American Sociological Review, American Journal of Sociology, Theory and Society, Socioeconomic Review, to name a few. And he has written on a broad range of topics in the area of class, work, and gender. His journal articles include comparative empirical analyses of the gender gap in job authority and in the glass ceiling, um, right down to fine-grained assessments of class theory. Um, so given his academic and intellectual reach, it is within considerable enthusiasm and indeed excitement <laughs> that I hand over the floor to our speaker, Professor Eric Ellen Wright. Thank you. I had a uh, very long association with Rosemary Crompton. I'm pretty sure, although I can't prove it, that she published the first critique of my work. Uh, I was a brand newly minted sociologist, just finished my PhD and published an article in New Left Review that appeared in August of 1976. Uh, she, at that time, must have been right in the midst of writing economy and class structure because the preface to the volume is dated February 1977. Now, most people, when they are writing, in the midst of writing the final slog of a book, are not also systematically reading the most recent stuff that comes out. You know, they're trying to synthesize what they've been studying for a while. And yet, um, there are four or five pages in the book criticizing my approach to Marx's class analysis. Now, you might think that um, as a young scholar, having the first thing published, it was a, an appreciative critique, but that it was quite critical would have been discouraging, but quite to the contrary. I think when you're beginning, particularly if you're on the fringes of the mainstream and you're a critic of the heart of the discipline, the thing that you're most worried about is not being taken seriously. Uh, and the, the, the nightmare is to be ridiculed, you know, to be laughed at for what you're doing. She took me dead seriously, and it was a source of really considerable encouragement for me to be taken seriously by an established scholar such as Rosemary right off the bat. Uh, 
Well, whoops, goes this way. 30 years later, Rosemary <coughs> was one of the key participants in a book I shepherded as part of the Real Utopias Project, a book called Gender Equality, published in, 19, in 2009. The title was Gender Equality, not Gender Inequality, because the spirit of the Real Utopias Project is to anchor its particular endeavors around the emancipatory ideals rather than around the problems they're meant to transcend. So it's always pointing towards future possibilities, of course, via a critique of the world as it is. Well, Rosemary wrote an essay on the empirical variations across countries and the interconnection between state policies, the gender division of labor and home, and attitudes towards gender equality. She wrote an article for this book. All of the pieces in the book were written specifically in the context of a workshop that, discovered, that uh, discussed a particular proposal for transformation, in this case a proposal written by Janet Gornick and Marsha Myers. Her central point in that book was that quite similar public policies can have very different practical effects in different places depending upon the cultural context in which they were implemented. Near the end of that contribution, she wrote the following, <clears throat> and I'll just quote briefly from a, a passage from the book. In the second part of the 20th century, the ideology of masculine supremacy has been successfully challenged in Western societies, and women have been formally recognized as the equals of men. What have proved to be much more enduring, however, are deep-seated norms and cultural beliefs about what men and women are good at and how they should behave. As we have seen, these essentialist gender norms, and more importantly, the associated behaviors, have been more persistent in France and Portugal than in the other three countries studied in the Employment and Family Project. As far as gender equality is concerned, changing these norms and the behavior associated with them is as important a task as developing institutions that support gender egalitarianism. Changing the norms and culture is as important as public policies that directly deal with institutions and how they're organized. That's the task I want to take on for this lecture. Uh, for those of you who know my work in general, this is somewhat far afield from what I usually work on. I'm not usually thought of as a sociologist of culture, in which trying to change norms as such is the central focus of my work. My work has been primarily centered around institutions and power, and particularly class relations. Here I'm going to shift my attention towards gender, and particularly focus on the normative aspect, the moral and cultural underpinnings of gender relations. Uh, here's how I'm going to proceed. I'm going to begin with what I hope won't be a kind of tedious exercise of reading a dictionary. I will be, begin by laying out a conceptual menu. Uh, in discussions around these kinds of issues, I think it's very important that we're all on the same page with respect to how words are going to be used to avoid the talking past each other that Rosemary referred to in one of the comments that was made in the introduction to her work. Uh, so I'm going to give you a brief primer in concepts that are needed to think through the problem of emancipatory possibilities around gender. So spend the first part of the talk with a conceptual menu. Uh, then I want to shift attention specifically to the problem of care work. I'll explain what that means. And treat care work as, and the gendered character of care work, as in a sense one of the central processes that underpins gender inequality more broadly. And then ask the question, how can we go about changing the cultural underpinnings of a gendered world of care work? Uh, mostly the talk is going to be theoretical and conceptual, kind of laying out how to think about these things. There will be a little bit of empirical work towards the end, and I will conclude then with a discussion of some 
elements of a real utopian view of how to undermine the norms that reinforce gender inequality. That's a big agenda. I'm going to try to do this in about 40, 45 minutes so that we'll have time for discussion. Okay, so to begin with, as part of this conceptual underpinning, I need to explain even what I'm talking about as an egalitarian. What's the emancipatory ideal that really is undergirding this whole discussion? What do we mean when we talk about equality as a value and as a component of an emancipatory vision? I define the egalitarian ideal this way. All people should have equal access to the social and material means necessary to live a flourishing life. Now, this is not a gendered, a gender-specific formulation of the ideal of equality. This applies to class. It applies to ethnicity or race, to disability. It applies to any property of social relations in which inequalities currently exist. And what it means to remove those inequalities is to create the possibility that all people should have equal access to social and material means necessary to leave a a flourishing life, live a flourishing life. Let me just make a couple of comments, just to get the texture of this rather complex definition. <clears throat> I say equal access, not equal opportunity. Many egalitarians think that the egalitarian ideal is that all people should have equal opportunity. Equal access, I think, is actually a deeper and more sociological understanding of the problem. Equal opportunity is consistent with um, what's sometimes called starting gate equality of opportunity. It's also consistent with a lottery. I mean, after all, a lottery, everybody has equal opportunity to thrive or fail. Uh, equal opportunity, I think, is not the way to think about the deeper intu intuition about what an egalitarian believes, or at least one radical version of egalitarianism, which is that all people should have equal access to what, it needs to what they need to flourish. Of course, there may be constraints as to how well you can achieve that ideal, but the ideal itself is a stronger one than just equal opportunity. It's access to what? It's access to both the material and social means, so the problem of recognition is just as central to the egalitarian project as the simpler idea of just access to the material resources needed. And why and what is the purpose of all this? It's to live a flourishing life. Now that's a very controversial formulation uh, because once you press it and try to figure out what do you mean by flourishing, it's very difficult to nail this down without entering the minefield of cultural standards for what counts as flourishing. I'm going to bracket all of those complexities and assume that we have a kind of general shared understanding of the difference between lives that uh, flourish and lives that languish, lives that realize potentials and lives that are stunted and thwarted without delving deeply here into exactly the content of that. OK, that's my egalitarian premise. Gender emancipation means then that all people, men and women, boys and girls, should have equal access to the social and material means necessary to live a flourishing life. So what does this mean in terms of the goals of egalitarians? Well, for class, nobody says the goal of class emancipation is class equality. <clears throat> no, it's the dissolution of class. The normative goal is classlessness. It's the dissolution of class. Indeed, the idea of class equality is a kind of oxymoron, because the very idea of class is about a certain kind of inequality in access to material resources. For race, I think, the egalitarian ideal is the dissolution of race as a salient social category. It's not that we should have equality between categories that are well-defined as socially salient races. Now, I don't mean by that that everybody becomes beige, so to speak, that there's an eradication of any physical differences between people. It's just they cease to be 
socially constructed categories of demarcation. The emancipatory ideal for class is the dissolution of class. The emancipatory ideal for race is the dissolution of race, not its validation, but on equal terms. But with gender, it's a little trickier. Is the emancipatory ideal of gender, around gender, gender equality, or is it genderlessness? Is it the dissolution of gender as a social category? How should we think about the issue of emancipation and equality with respect to the category of gender? Okay, so that's a conceptual problem. I'm now going to give you this menu of terms and how to talk about them in which will help at least provide an understanding of what I mean by the goal of degendering social relations rather than simply the idea of equality between well-defined gender categories. So here's my conceptual menu. This is going to be hopelessly familiar to many of you, and uh, probably for those of you who haven't delved deeply into contemporary sociology, this, some of these ideas might be new. But I still think it's worth going through them. First, Sex versus gender. Sex is a biological category. Gender is a social category. Often the way this is described is that gender is a socially constructed category. Uh, a few years ago, there was a um, Kentucky Derby in which a filly was one of the favorite horses. Uh, Rachel Alexander, I think, was some, some name like that, some feminine name. And Interviewers at the time interviewed women, especially, uh, to see if they were excited that a horse of their gender was running. <laughs> Horses don't have gender. <laughs> they just don't. They're not embedded in socially constructed gender relations. They have sex, but they don't have gender. <clears throat> gender relations. Gender relations are the socially generated system of appropriate roles for biological males and females enforced by various kinds of mechanisms, norms, laws, coercion, material incentives, religious beliefs, etc. Gender relations are the appropriate roles or relations. Roles are always relational, so the appropriate relations assigned to biological categories. That's gender relations. Gender identity are the internalized self-concepts built through the interaction of biological dispositions and gender relations. Identities are the interior self-concepts that are the consequence of very complex interactions between whatever biological dispositions people have as they live their lives within these socially constructed relations. And gender inequality, then, are inequalities in power, income, and status that are connected to gender relations. Continued on the menu. Sex equality, not gender equality, but sex equality means there are no inequalities of power, income, and status among categories based on biological sex, males, females, and other categories of sex itself that have become increasingly salient in such discussions. Uh, gender equality, as an idea, means Socially constructed gender categories continue to exist and are normatively enforced, but there are no inequalities of power, income, or status that correspond to these categories. That's what a gender, equal gender equality would mean. There would be well-defined, socially constructed, and enforced categories, but there would be no inequalities of power, status, or income between them. Genderlessness, then, means there are no normatively backed differentiations of appropriate roles for males and females. Genderlessness does not mean, the idea of a genderless structure of relations does not mean that all identities are androgynous. It's not a claim about sex. It's not a claim about androgeneity, androgynous sexual identities. 
It's simply a statement that in the world in which a full process of degendering has occurred, there is no normative expectations as to how a little boy or a little girl should behave as they grow up. It would not be seen as strange for a boy to want to be an active caregiver of children. That would not be seen as deviant from some standard. That's what it means to degender the relationships, that roles cease to be assigned to people on the basis of biological attributes. Uh, now care work. <clears throat> care work is a term that's become current in the last, I suppose, decade or two. I don't know exactly when that term became current in sociology. It's a fairly recent term in the discipline. It's particularly important in the feminist literature, but I think it's now migrated into more general sociological discussions. It's a way of talking about a very wide range of activities uh, that are directly involved with tending to the emotional and physical needs of people. The word work is used in care work, both because these activities often take the form of work in the ordinary sense, paid employment to take care of these tasks, but it's also a way of acknowledging the effort and commitment and labor involved in providing these activities, even when it takes place outside of the formal structures of employment. Care work lies at the center, I think, of a set of intersecting concerns of feminists, Marxists, and other currents of emancipatory theory. It's become one of the focal areas of research and theorizing to understand both the obstacles of social change and the possibilities for social change. It's crucial for the issues of gender inequality, its reproduction and transformation. That's what I'll be talking about today. Uh, there's increasing discussions of class relations in the provision of care work outside the family. There's very uh, interesting research on the global flows of immigrant labor tied to care work. There's a kind of commodity chain of care work that occurs because of the migration of particularly women from the global south to the global north to, north to provide care work in order to liberate the paid labor of women, pr primarily, to perform in the labor force. And care work is at the center of discussions of emancipatory alternatives. It's an interesting problem, care work, because of, it's one of the prime examples of a form of labor that gets provided in such dramatically different ways within the existing society. Uh, this is a little two by two table. I'm very fond of two by two tables. I mean, I, any self-respecting sociologist has to be fond of two by two tables. Uh, when students come to me and they have a list of three of something, I tell them there's something missing. There's a fourth. There's a fourth category. If, if you have three of something, there's probably two dimensions. And if you cross them, you'll find the fourth category. And every once in a while, I say that, of course, in jest, but every once in a while, a student then goes and thinks hard about their problem, and sure enough, they discover they were missing something. It's a good exercise. Whenever you have three of something, See what the missing fourth is. Well, this is a little just diagram to illustrate the point. Uh, care work can be provided through the mobilization of private resources or collective resources. And it can be organized primarily around norms and values concerned with meeting needs or norms and values with concerning rights and interests. And I think uh, family-provided childcare is needs-oriented private provision. Market-based childcare services are interest-based private provision. State-provided childcare is collective provision under a rights forma, uh, format. And what can be called the social economy of childcare is collective provision under normative uh, regulation by needs. So what I want to do is study, is discuss the, does this work? No, this isn't. The, the lower right-hand corner, family child care. 
uh, I'm going to um, make an argument that um, the most, one of the most difficult tasks of transforming gender relations in an emancipatory way in general centers around the transformation of the gender division of labor inside the family and then propose ways we can think about such transformation. The um, argument is going to be built around four theses. The first is that genderlessness is the necessary condition for sex equality. That is, degendering social relations, getting rid of the normative assignment of people to roles by virtue of their biological sex is one of the necessary conditions. I don't want to make it that this is the only necessary condition, but for full bore sex equality. So long as there is an assignment of differential roles, that will undermine whatever other efforts are made to create an egalitarian access to the conditions for human flourishing. Struggles for gender equality are a strategic necessity that is reducing the inequality between, um, within gender relations is a strategic necessity, but it is not the emancipatory goal. Sex equality is the goal, genderlessness is the relationship that's needed for that to be achieved. Uh, this is quite parallel to the issue for class. Within a capitalist society, we struggle in various ways to reduce inequalities between classes, but that isn't the emancipatory goal. The emancipatory goal is the dissolution of class, not just a more equal class structure. The gender division of labor in care work perpetuates broader patterns of gender inequality. Uh, there's lots of things that perpetuate broader patterns of gender inequality. Uh, sexual commodification perpetuates broader patterns of gender inequality. L cultural symbols perpetuate broader patterns of gender inequality. I am not going to make the argument that the gender division of labor and care work is the single most important determinant of broader patterns of gender inequality, but I do think it's a fundamental one. And within the problem of the gender division of labor and care work, the gender division of labor in the family is, a, is really a pivotal and difficult problem for further degendering inequality. So how should we think about that problem? Let me begin by um, showing you a little diagram. This actually emerged in the context of the book that uh, Rosemary worked on with me, uh, the gender, when she participated in the gender equality, really utopia book. This particular way of posing the problem appeared in, in my discussion there. What I'm going to compare are two worlds, the existing world where we have um, fairly strong gendered norms as to what the appropriate roles for men and women are around caregiving. And what we want to look at is the actual intensity of caregiving behavior by men and women in this first world and then compare it with a hypothetical distribution in a world with weak gender norms. So this isn't data, this is just my sort of speculative reconstruction from our common understanding of the world. Uh, there are women, of course, who do very little caregiving labor. And there are women who do a huge quantity of nothing but caregiving labor. And the mode is on the high end of the spectrum. Uh, for men in the world today, typically, the distribution looks something like this. There are certainly men who are as committed and deeply engaged in caregiving labor as most women. And there are certainly women who are as uninvolved in caregiving labor as most men. The, the distributions, even in the world as it is, overlap, but there is a fairly substantial gender gap in caregiving. Um, my hypothesis is that in a world with weak gender norms, where there were weak or no expectations, I'm saying weak to not be completely utopian about this, uh, in weak gender norms, where it's not considered deviant, where men and masculinity is not identified with toughness and 
lack of emotionality, and where uh, men and women equally are expected to participate in caregiving activities. There might still be some gap between the average actual behavior of men and women. There may be, contrary to the completely anti-essentialist view, there may be some difference in the distribution of whatever biological dispositions are underpinning caregiving. There may be a different, a different distribution connected to sex differences between biological men and biological women. But it's got to be way less than the distributions of behaviors in a world with such strong gender norms. So what I can say with confidence is that the gender gap in caregiving would be way smaller under conditions of weak gender norms than under conditions of strong gender norms. I can't say with confidence that the gap would disappear. Uh, if there is a different distribution of underlying biological dispositions, and there may be, then one would expect that even in the absence of norms, there'd be a different distribution of behaviors. That is, even in an absence of norms that says this is what you ought to do by virtue of your sex, there would be a different distribution of what people actually did. If there is any difference in the distributions of underlying biological tendencies. My claim, though, is that that's a way smaller gap between men and women than what you would observe in the world where whatever differences exist biologically are exacerbated and ex or exaggerated by the prevailing social and cultural system. So the problem then is how do we move from the existing world to the world on the right? How do we actually erode gender norms about caregiving? How should we think about that process? Well, there are two kinds of mechanisms that I think we have to attend to. One is psychological. Uh, there are psychological mechanisms that are bound up with the reproduction of social norms. In the 1950s in the United States in discussions of racism, uh, on the cusp of the civil rights era, you know, when social psychologists were studying the nature of racism in the American South and what it would take to transform uh, race relations, uh, Thomas Pettigrew, a social psychologist of that era, made a distinction between two psychological processes by which people behaved in racist ways. One was sheer conformism. People were racist because they thought everybody else was racist, and they were simply conforming to what they thought was the expected thing for them to do and say. Other people were racist because they felt it. They were what you might think of as organically racist. I don't mean by, that it was rooted in their biology, but that they had deep emotional connection to the hatred and disgust that was bound up with racism. They had internalized it as dispositions and emotional salience, not just as conformity to what they thought was expected of them. Now, the problem of transforming racism was then posed as a problem that depended upon what the ratios of these dispositions were. If most people just conformed to what they thought they were supposed to do, one might expect very rapid change if you forced people to do different things. If most people were deeply emotionally committed racists in that very strong sense that it was hard and deeply internalized into their very identities, um, then it would be a much tougher task. Well, I think the same thing can be said about um, sexism and gender relations. Many men behave as men because that's what they think they're supposed to do, and they think that they're conforming to the expectations. Others feel that this is part of their deeper identity and that a man just doesn't do that sort of thing, taking care of babies, changing nappies, whatever. Uh, we don't know what the ratio is between one or the other of these, but that would be one of the things that we'd have to really understand, if we could, to see how easy it would be to shift the norms in the society. Are they anchored just in conformism, primarily? to a set of standards, I observe what you do, aha, I'm supposed to behave that way? Or are they anchored in more deeply rooted identities? 
And the second issue has to do with the connection between norms and um, public behavior. In a stable system, which is not being buffeted about and transformed, the norms that people internalize affects their behavior. They observe what other people do, which reinforces their sense that those are the norms. So you have a kind of feedback process where public behavior and internalized norms correspond to each other. But this connection, uh, how fragile that connection is, depends upon this, these internal processes and the extent to which you can change the public behavior in ways that then flips the sense of what the appropriate behavior is. Let me illustrate that by drawing a contrast between what could be called the optimistic scenario of the relationship between observed behavior of others and the transformation of norms and the pessimistic scenario. So here's the optimistic scenario. On the horizontal axis is the percent of fathers who take active, visible care of children. The visibility is important because that's the public behavior that signals to others a change in uh, what's expected. And on the vertical axis is the percentage of all people that believe it is just as appropriate for men as for women to be heavily engaged in childcare activities. So the optimistic view says, if we can somehow or other get about 20% of fathers to begin actively taking care of children in public and visible ways so that it's known by the broader community. If we can get it up to around 20%, then a little bit more it's going to rapidly change. You'll hit a tipping point, an inflection point in the curve, where you'll jump from less than 25% of the population thinking that that's the proper things to do to over 50%. Right, so you get a tipping point that makes that transformation more tractable so long as you can figure out ways to encourage men to change their behavior. The pessimistic scenario says you're going to have to get over 50% of men to behave this way before most people are going to accept this as a changed set of norms. Uh, we don't really have the data on this. This is, again, made up two possible scenarios. There isn't really a way, I think, uh, at least I haven't seen a way of active of studying this empirically. Uh, I think there are reasons to be optimistic, though. I think that uh, gender norms are in a rapid period of fragility. And uh, the possibility of, a, of observing then a very rapid change with a little bit more progress is possible. Uh, how far have norm, gendered norms changed around the division of labor? So here's the empirical bit, just a little bit of data about how the world has progressed. Uh, this will be fairly familiar data to lots of you. This is just a very long stretch of time picture of the uh, number of hours weekly spent by men and women uh, in doing work around the home. Uh, and men's work has increased, and women's work has decreased, the amount of work women do around the home has declined considerably since the 1960s, but the gap remains quite considerable. Uh, here's some um, more recent data based on fairly fine-grained time budget study. This is the ratio of the time devoted per week on routine housework by mothers and fathers in homes with children. So it's, a, it's not everybody, but this is the contexts where the demands on time are the most severe. In 1965, when Rosemary started her career in the United States, and I doubt it was very different in Britain at the time, uh, it was 19 to 1. Women did 19 times as much housework as men. Now it's down to 3 and a third to 1. Uh, when, you, when you actually look at um, the kind of time budgets involved with this, 
it's because women have re it's more because women have reduced the amount of time they spend than men have increased. Uh, houses are messier, and that's a good thing. You know, the, it's important that the standards of cleanliness and order in houses go down because that's one of the. Uh, it's a different aspect of this normative structure. It's one of the structures, the norms that makes it harder to generate egalitarian distributions. Uh, this is uh, for childcare. Childcare turns out to be really quite difficult to measure because some of childcare is just having fun with your kids, right? So if fathers go out and kick a football around the backyard garden with their kids, <laughs> right? Uh, is that childcare or is that just fooling around and having fun with your kids? Uh, childcare is also hard to measure because of multitasking. If you're cooking dinner and watching the kids at the same time, do you get double credit? Is that you know, an hour of childcare and an hour of, uh, of cooking? So the, the, the research that is involved with this has lots of complexities. Nevertheless, I think the trends are clear. That is that um, men, uh, the ratio of uh, child care time spent by fathers and mothers has become more equal since the 1960s and yet remains quite unequal among fathers and mothers in homes with children. Um, and yet we have this. Uh, 30 years ago you would not have been able to find photos in magazines, in public places like this. Uh, these are photos that reflect cultural transformation. Uh, they're still unusual. Uh, I, until I looked for these photos, I didn't know there was a magazine called Dad's Adventure. And I thought, troubleshooting crying babies as, a, as, a, um, <laughs> as the banner headline on a magazine directed for men. Now this next, the, the next slide, the next slide, I think all the men in the room will be aware of. I don't know how many women are aware that in men's rooms in international airports everywhere now, there are diaper or nappy changing tables. Uh, was this, does everybody know this already? Was this news to you? Uh, now, uh, I asked my, my wife, uh, about this, how often did, did, does she see an actual woman changing an actual baby's nappies in a women's room, restroom, and she mentioned that on her flight to, um, to London just the other day, she saw one, and I was thinking back, how many times have I seen it over the years? You know, rarely, but not zero, not never. And it's there, and it's an example, having a, man, a changing room, a diaper changing room, in a men's restroom is a public declaration that this is an appropriate thing for men to do. There's a, um, a law in California to make it mandatory that in all public restrooms there has to be changing tables in the men's rooms, not just in uh, international airports. Well, all this indicates that there are changes that have take, taken place, that norms have changed. Nevertheless, as we know, the, process, the pace of this change has been dreadfully slow in many people's sense of how fast they want things to change. By historical standards, it's a blink of the eye. You know, if you think about 10,000 years of a gendered division of labor over, well, 10,000 years, just meaning since um, recorded civilization, 100,000 years of Homo sapiens, uh, the tending of small children has been women's work, and um, that in a generation we get diaper changing tables and restrooms and images like this does indicate, on the one hand, rapid change, but we also have this, the robust continuing inequalities in, the, in child care and in housework, and a sense that um, things made, there were changes between the 60s and the 90s, but things seem to have stabilized and not that much change has occurred in the last 15 or 20 years. So the question then is, what can be done? What sorts of policies might we do 
that would accelerate the degendering of care work, that would further erode the sense of what it's appropriate for men and for women to do. How do we deliberately change cultural standards? Now, the simplest strategy, which everybody knows, is just to yell about it, to have advertisement, just cultural messages of various sorts, to talk about the virtues of transformed norms. And of course, in the arts, on television, you see role models in television shows with fathers behaving differently. All of that, of course, is part of the process. I don't want to, uh, and that's the sort of thing that cultural sociologists tend to emphasize. Cultural sociologists tend to emphasize purely cultural strategies for the transformation of culture. Change the message and eventually you might change the, the, the culture. I want to um, think of this in a different way. One might think of this as a more materialist way. I want to think about ways in which you can change the behaviors of people by making it harder for men to behave in certain ways and easier to behave in other ways. It's, all, it's about changing the behavior of men. I want to focus on the way we can change the circumstances of men so they're to encourage certain behaviors and discourage others with the idea that if, we can, if we're at that more optimistic scenario and we're sort of in the, my rough guess is that roughly, you know, sort of 10 or 15 percent of dads are active caregivers in this very visible and committed way, for young children especially. Uh, we do know that in roughly 10 percent of households, men do more housework than their wives now. Only 10 percent. But if we can get that up to the 25 percent range, then I think we might hit that tipping point where the norms begin to really crumble. Uh, so how can we do that beyond just telling people that's what you ought to do because it's a nice way to be? Right? That doesn't strike me as the most promising thing. What, how can we do? Uh, one, there's a recent example of a very dramatic change of norms that occurred by directly changing behavior and then the norms followed, and it's around smoking. Uh, once it was banned from offices and banned from buildings and people had to really, especially in Wisconsin in January, you know, if you wanted to smoke in the social sciences building in Wisconsin, you had to go to sub-zero temperatures outside to do it. <laughs> And then they required that you move away from the doors. You, can't, you couldn't just huddle in the entryway. You had to actually go out into the cold. Well, it's now the case. It's not just that the behavior has changed as a result. It's now seen as really kind of unpleasant when somebody lights up in a closed space. You know, it's seen as just inappropriate. Well, we know you can directly affect cultural expectations about the proper way to behave by changing behavior. Can, what, other ways we might do this around the gender division of labor. That was the central question of the book that I worked on in which Rosemary participated uh, as part of the Real Utopias project. So let me just briefly discuss three of the kind of real utopian ideas. This expression, real utopia, it's a, it's a kind of oxymoron, right? Utopia means nowhere, perfect place. They're not real. The idea is to think about social innovations which embody the world that you want, but you build it in the world as it is, and you do so in such a way that it actually moves you closer to the world you want. So it's, it's this kind of trying to create the, a virtuous feedback process that moves you forward rather than just ameliorates problems as they exist. It's, so it's different from just saying, how can we make life better for people? That's important too, of course. This is how can we make life better for people in ways that erodes the dominant institutions and moves us towards the more egalitarian and emancipatory goal. Okay, the first, um, the first idea is what could be called father incentivizing parental leads. This was the main thing we talked about at this in the in the book on gender equality. Uh, parental leaves are, uh, uh, there's a broad family of types. They all have the character of uh, legally mandating that people be allowed to have paid leave 
to deal with parenting responsibilities at the birth of a child, for the illness of a child. Sometimes they're caregiving leaves, not just parenting leaves, because they could be applied to the care of an elder parent, for example. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> these leaves can be organized in a variety of ways. One way would be what could be called equality impeding leaves. So an example of an equality impeding leaves are maternal leaves, that only mothers are given paid leave. Fathers can't take it. And for a long time, that was, as I understand it, the way it was done in Germany. In Germany, mothers could get paid leave, but not fathers. Well, that is an equality impeding leave. Equality enabling leaves our leave time is allocated to families, but the family decides how to divide it up. That was how it was originally done in Sweden. They had very generous parental leaves allocated a certain amount of time, let's say a year, to the family, but the family could decide how it was done. Well, naturally, women took overwhelming, the overwhelming amount of that. It was um, typically 11 months of a, of a year's leave would be taken by the mother and only a month by the father. There's also what could be called equality promoting leaves. Uh, these are leaves that are allocated to persons, not to families. So the mother is allocated by law six months of paid parental leave and the father is allocated six months of paid parental leave at the birth of a child, let's say, and it's use it or lose it. It can't be reallocated from one parent to the other. Well, that promotes equality because often if the leave is generous, there's a strong incentive for the family to take advantage of it, but they can't take advantage of it on an inegalitarian basis. Uh, there's an even stronger version of an equality promoting leave, which has other objections to, but it's worth thinking about just because it, it indicates the nature of the problem. You could have a leave system, a parental paid leave system, that had the following formal structure. Uh, at the birth of a child, the mother gets several weeks of, of maternity leave for, the, for health reasons connected with childbirth. But after whatever that initial amount of time is, caregiving leaves are allocated to the family on the basis of how much time the father takes. That is, for every week a father takes parental leave, the mother gets a week. Um, so that, that forces equality. If they're going to take leaves at all, they have to do it equally. Now, that's objectionable on lots of grounds. It gives a lot of power to fathers. They can decide, <laughs> you know, they can refuse, and then they're punishing their wives and children. Uh, I'm not proposing this as a real utopian idea. But it does suggest that the idea, that it does, I think, bring into relief the nature of the problem. How do you create incentives that will induce people to behave in different ways, in this case around early childhood caregiving, that to behave in different ways that then ratify alternative norms? Okay, that's one class of possible transformations. A second concerns the public sector. At the moment, we know from many studies of wage inequality associated with different occupational tasks that there is what is called a caregiving penalty in work settings. That is, work that has high caregiving content gets paid less even when you control for uh, the gender division of labor. That is, it's not just because women are doing it, but even among women's work, caregiving labor is further devalued. Uh, the, the caregiving penalty, controlling for skills and education and other things, is generally estimated in the 10 to 15 percent range. So one way in which you could attack the behaviors by encouraging more men to engage in uh, early childhood education and in daycare services and in other forms of 
caregiving would be not merely to eliminate the caregiving penalty, but to create a caregiving premium. One could argue that uh, caregiving has such important positive externalities for the society at large that caregivers should be paid more than other workers because of the need to incentivize participation in the caregiving sector because of its positive externalities that are not recovered just in the costs of the services. A caregiving premium in wages would have the effect then of contributing to the degendering of public paid care work. I think many men would like to do early childhood education if it paid commensurate to the skills and effort uh, that those jobs entail. Finally, and in a way most obviously, uh, <coughs> the high, high quality public provision of affordable caregiving services. I do think that relieving the burden on families to provide the bulk of caregiving labor is one of the ways to make it easier for people to navigate uh, a more egalitarian set of relationships within the household itself. Ultimately, this is where degendering is fought out. It's in the intimate lives of people, in their own households, as they struggle over housework and caregiving labor. That's the site, the micro settings within which a degendered set of relations occur. And the provision of good quality, publicly provided caregiving services is one of the ways of reducing the stakes in those internal struggles by making it easier to negotiate more egalitarian relations. But of course, there's no guarantees here. Uh, this is one of the findings in Rosemary's own research on this topic. France, she noted, provided relatively high level of good quality public child care services outside the home. France is often thought of as exemplary in the structure of its public provision of creches, uh, which makes um, it one of the leading cases for good quality public child care and yet has relatively traditional gender divisions of labor within the family, which also generated high levels of stress in the lives of working mothers in France. They were more stressed than uh, working women in Sweden, for example, without Sweden having better public provision of childcare. It was because the public provision of childcare in and of itself didn't erode the gendered expectations about the work that's done in the home. Her explanation was that there was less erosion of traditional gender norms in France than in many other countries with similar levels of public support for childcare. Radical egalitarians interested in realizing egalitarian ideals for gender beyond the current limits must ultimately worry about these issues, about how to change norms and connect, that connect gender work within the family and in the public sphere. As sociologists, I think this means we should look carefully at the way in which norms and behavior interact and try to understand the contexts in which the erosion of public norms seems to have undergone the most rapid transformation. Ultimately, of course, all of this is bound up with a much bigger agenda. Uh, as those of you who know other things I've written, I haven't much mentioned capitalism or class except in passing a couple of times perhaps in this lecture. Ultimately, I think in order to fully accomplish the kinds of generous father incentivizing parental leaves, caregiving premium and wages, and high quality public provision of affordable caregiving services, this can't be done in a neoliberal world in which public provision of anything is disparaged and the market is seen as the only way in which we can solve problems. A necessary condition then, I would argue, for a deeper transformation of the conditions under which gender inequality is reproduced is transforming the relationship um, of the state and public and, and the provision of public goods 
uh, to a market economy, and that can't be done under conditions in which public sector and collective provision is viewed as uh, <clears throat> an inefficient and inappropriate use of resources. I mean, to say it in the grander way, I think ultimately the struggle towards socialism is a necessary condition for the full realization of the conditions under which these specific gender goals can be realized, which is not to imply that the struggle over gender has to wait until the revolution. It's simply that the realization of the egalitarian and emancipatory goals cannot take place under the resource constraints that exist in a capitalist society. Thank you very much. Um, I had one question, well, two questions. One is I think Rosemary would really have enjoyed this because in that Anglo-French study, one of the things she would say about it, it's not actually about whether you're a doctor or a banker, it's about whether you care. And the men who care get a raw deal just as much as the women, is by something she would always say. But my question to you is in... Why haven't you mentioned, first of all, change in norms and acceptance around lesbian and gay lives? Because that has been a massive change sure. since the 70s, and it affects what, what are real men like. Um, and secondly, the question of care, your focus, why only focus on small kids? Because really, care changes so much over the whole life cycle, especially with elder care. Who cares for whom? So we may think older people uh, we're going to be caring for them, but actually some of them are caring for our, their grandchildren in some of the projects sure. we've been doing. So the question was really, first of all, why didn't you talk about lesbian and gay, and why didn't you talk about care as something, the heteroscedacity of it across the sure, last cycle? Sure. So let me answer the second one first. Uh, of course, care work is much broader than just caring for children. I do think that the care of children is the core of what genders care work. That is, I think, because of the connection between biological reproduction and childhood, and, ch and childbirth and early childhood, and the long historical uh, and social relational process through which that gets organized, I think that is the core that genders other forms of care work. And, and it's the most difficult of, I think, the most difficult of the transformation problems around norms over care work uh, because so much of it takes place in the intimate settings of homes. A lot of, it's true, care work for elderly also takes place within families, but to a lesser extent than care work of children. Uh, that is, very few children, babies are in the equivalent of nursing homes. You know, the, the daycare centers are not like nursing homes, where families can externalize the care of elderly. So that's why I focused on it. But of course, if I was giving a, a full account of the dilemmas around changing norms around care work, it would include uh, education, the care work within schooling, care work within, for the elderly, uh, care work around health more generally, uh, Meant all of those issues would also be part of it. But I do think it's, it's still appropriate to not see these as just a laundry list of care work, that the problem of children really is central to this in a, in a way that's different from other kinds of care work. Uh, so I didn't discuss sexuality at all. You know, so it wasn't just the question of heterosexuality, homosexuality, and other forms of sexual identity and sexual expression. Um, and that's because the, gen the question of gender norms per se, what's the appropriate way for gender relations, the relations be built around gender that involve domination of women by men. I don't think that the issue of sexual identity is the centerpiece of what defines gender relations. I think sexual relations are an additional dimension of social relations that are connected to gender, but are not as central to the problem of transforming gender norms as is the division of labor over the provision of 
care. Uh, it's also the case that that's what I've studied. I haven't studied the sexuality dimensions of it. And, um, and therefore, it's not been as central to my own thinking about these issues. Now, that said, you know, this is, um, this is an open area where we, if we want to ask the question, to what extent are the, the images that, you know, the, the images that I focused on here, to what extent can we explain why we get these images in the 2000s, but not in the 1970s? To what extent is that because of the changing sexual norms around gay and lesbian and other sexual expression? And to what extent is this because of direct transformations of norms around the appropriate roles of men with respect to children? That's, I guess, an empirical question. Uh, and I, um, I'm, I'm fumbling around on the question, on the answer to the question, because it's not something that I actually have any deep theoretical ideas about. That's probably the best way to answer a question that, you know, we're, this is just, just as a side, just as a side, no, seriously, as a side comment around this. Uh, <clears throat> When, when academics, especially seasoned academics, venture off of their home territory, you know, my home territory is class and capitalism and what's wrong with capitalism and how to transform it. So when you venture off into appropriately connected topics, but which are not your home territory, of course there's lots of issues that one hasn't thought deeply about. So exactly how the, the enormously important transformations of sexual uh, norms around sexuality, public norms around sexuality, how that figures in this and whether that's mostly a consequence of the degendering of relations or it's the partial degendering or whether it's a substantial contributor, it's not something I have an answer to. Uh, thanks. Hi, I'm Matt Vidal. I'm at King's College London and Eric was my PhD advisor and mentor, so we go back a long ways. Um, Eric, all clear and provocative and, and, and penetrating as always. But you start off noting that part of the issue could be norms, part of the issue could be deeply held beliefs. It seems like almost all of what you talked about is mainly directed toward changing norms. But my reading of cultural theory and, and social constructionist theory is that what, uh, is that, is that the, the main issue in social constructed categories and in cultural categories are deeply held belief systems, uh, ideologies that constitute people as, constitute the subjectivity and the identity of people. So the question is, I mean, it, do you have an idea, have you thought through how these kind of changes in formal institutions might affect deeply held cultural beliefs rather than just changing norms? Um, and I think as, a, as a, an addition to that, do you have an idea? Do, do you think it's mainly a normative issue, or do you think that gender um, discrimination is, is, is more deeply held, ingrained in people's identities and ways of um, understanding it? So, so I wouldn't draw the distinction between norms and beliefs the way you did. That is, people, a norm says, what is the appropriate behavior for men and women? And that's a belief. You have a belief that this is appropriate for men and this is appropriate for women. Uh, so norms are believed by people. So they're part of your beliefs. I was drawing a distinction between norms and identities, not between norms and beliefs. Uh, identity is not just this is how men ought to behave. It's that I find it disgusting when men behave like women. You know, it's a uh, the identity is just a, I'm using identity to mean a, a kind of morally and emotionally salient sense of who I am and how I am to be in the world, how I find meaning and uh, define my existence in the world. So I'm using identity to mean the equivalent of that organic racist analog in the discussion of racist conformists and racist, racists as um, deeply held not just beliefs in the cognitive sense, but emotionally embedded identities. Uh, so 
whether or not you can change norms easily or not depends in part on whether they are connected to such deeply held identities. And maybe that's part of where the sexuality issue then does really come into play here, because that the sexuality issues may be one of the ways that gendered norms get anchored in identities in this deeper way. And so the shaking up of the identity part of the equation through the opening up of uh, people's capacity to live their identities openly, may be that, that may be one of the connections then uh, around the norms and behavior problem. Hello, my name's Joe Greenwood. I'm from the University of Essex. Um, I wanted to refer back to the couple of charts you had on ratio. Um, what occurred to me was that whilst they show uh, what we could describe as, as progress, definitely, um, there's the, the crucial missing thing is, of course, that at the same time as that's been happening, women have been taking on way, way, way more hours of paid work. Mm. So actually, the burden overall for women has got worse, arguably. So my question really is, if you, if you accept that to be the case, how do we ensure when we're changing norms that we don't accidentally make other norms or other behaviors worse? Uh, well, of course, there's no guarantee that you don't accidentally make lots of things worse. Uh, the, the efforts to change the world for the better that have resulted in catastrophes are well known. Uh, in the present time, full-time homemakers have the most discretionary time. You know, so we are now actually at a point where is if you actually live in the traditional male breadwinner household, not very many people do, but if you do, mothers in those households have more discretionary time than their spouses, which was not true 50 years ago, but it is true now. So, um, but you're right, that the double shift problem, that working, working mothers, if you add up total work time including commute time. I mean, this kind of research is very sensitive to how you do it. Women don't spend as much time commuting as men. They work closer to home. So, uh, and commuting times can be very long, as I'm sure many of you know. So if you add, it, it's still the case though, that the, there is the double shift, that the amount of discretionary time of a working mother is less than a working father. So defining free time as the relevant egalitarian measure just on labor time, the total of, uh, of work. So um, yeah, so that's a problem and that has to be struggled over as well. I don't think that rendering the division of labor in the household more egalitarian, however, is likely to make that worse. If anything, it'll make that better. Uh, Tessa Wright from Queen Mary University of London. Um, just, I just wanted to follow up on, on Jackie's point, actually, because I think one of the things that is really interesting and, and relevant here about sexu sexuality is that there, there has been this massive change in social norms in a, in a, relative, well, a really short period of time. And I think you know, to sort of understand what is it that has, has prompted that change, because there's a, certainly in the UK there's been a kind of relationship between changes in the legislation, social movements, you know, very strong campaigning movements, and massive change, not universal at all, but massive change in social attitudes in, you know, like 10, 20 years, very, very short. So I think that is interesting and, and has a relationship with sort of social, changing social norms in the gender area as well. Um, but uh, just to, and, 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 but the point, the other point I wanted to make was about your, uh, your real utopias and the kind of the ways forward, I suppose. And I was thinking that the first point about um, the parental, changing the kind of parental leaves, I think your term for it, uh, father incentivizing parental leaves. Um, I've been thinking about this quite a bit this week, actually, because the next month there's a shared parental leave coming in in the UK, which, you know, is, is, is very flawed, but there, there's a kind of a, a cultural message go, going on there. But the problem, of course, with fathers trying to take that is still this gender pay gap is what, well, one of the problems. So therefore, it seems like your second one goes so closely right. with, with the, making the first one succeed. And I think it, that is the, the, the main one, isn't it? It's changing the, the, the value we give to care, caregiving in terms of pay. And that's, that's hard to achieve at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> no, th these are, of course, interconnected. Father incentivizing parental leaves are also easier if there's high quality public provision of childcare. So these aren't meant to be standalone policies, although, of course, the sequence in which they're introduced may uh, 
is opportunistic. It depends upon which. I, I, I just want to reflect on your point about the speed of transformation of um, sexuality norms, which is really quite astounding. You know, it's a, I don't think anybody would have predicted in the early days of the gay rights movement that by now same-sex marriage would be uh, as prevalent as it is. And if you look at the age gradient, if you look at the age gradient in the United States about views about same-sex marriage, you know, it's a, about as steep an age gradient on any attitude that you can find. Younger people just think it's ridiculous to not have uh, marriage equality. It's just it, 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 it's coming close to them not being able to understand well, how could this be, uh, whereas older generations still hang on to those. So the speed with which that eroded is very surprising, and I don't think, as far as I know, I have not seen a good theoretical argument for why those norms were so fragile, uh, because they seem so strong, and there was so much viciousness around their social enforcement. Uh, until very recently. So the speed with which those crumbled is really a puzzle. You know, it's a puzzle. Uh, and I, of course, we invoke social movements. Obviously, that had something to do with it. Uh, it it's still the case that we did not, our theories of how social movements change culture did not, would not predict the speed with which these norms were transformed. Uh, so I think that's a research question and for somebody to grapple with and try to come up with, with real answers, not tautologies. You know, it's easy to come up with tautologous answers. The norms change because the culture changed. I mean, that. Thanks, uh, Professor Wright. I'm, my name is Anish Kapadi. I teach politics here at um, City. And a, a comment, if I may, and then what I think is a comment, and then a question. My comment is, not being from outside the discipline, I've always been troubled by how sociologists discretize class, race, and gender. Because, of course, in lived experience, there are very few occasions in which we encounter race, class, and gender as such, uh, although there are, of course, occasions where we do. Um, most of the time, there are, I mean, everything's irreducibly gendered, raced, and classed. But there, because there are few occasions in which we encounter gender, race, or class as such, we then get into a situation where we, when we legislate for them, we take care of the extremes, as it were, and then we move ourselves into a situation in which we have formal equality but with the coexistence of substantive inequality um, because we've, as it were, taken care of the low-hanging fruit and then we're in a situation where we have a coexistence between, um, because we can't grapple with the kind of rich mixture of race, class, and gender. Um, because they're not encountered as such. And so then we tend to miss um, elements of exclusion which, where they're not presented as such. So that's, um, and I'm sure there's good sociology on interactivity between these things, and I'm just not aware of that. So that's, that's by way of comment. I suppose my question is, you, you've assumed the near universality of the traditional nuclear family. And that, of course, is, is, is changing. And in many ways, patriarchy and the nuclear family are sort of two peas in a pod because of the volume of care work in raising children. When you, when you nuclearize the family, that falls on one individual and there's a kind of hierarchy there. Whereas, of course, with the, with the family changing, not back to the extended family, to be sure, but perhaps a more extensive family, both on kinship and non-kinship lines, whereby if you talk to many people now, care, care work is distributed to grandparents and, and, and so on. If you don't assume, as you perhaps have, the polarity between, on the one hand, the nuclear family and then the state, but a middle ground where there are an extensive set of quasi-familial relationships that make themselves available for the distribution of uh, uh, the labor of care, how would that then, and that middle ground, as it were, presents itself as a field for legislation? Um, there's, a, there's a lurking methodological individualism um, in terms of incentives and, and, and carrots and sticks here um, that perhaps looks at only nuclear and the state. But if there's, a, if there's an extensive middle ground there, how would that change some of the way in which you, you, you approach this? Just one little comment. I don't think talking about incentives means 
methodological individualist. It just means that you have, you're trying to change the behavior of people. I mean, it's people that we want to change the behavior of, and all that incentive means is that you give inducements, and obstacles means you make it harder. Uh, web, the, the, so it's not methodological individualist in any kind of epistemological or methodological sense. Um, sure, uh, caregiving is provided by extended families. It's provided in communities by fictive kin, not just by biological kin. Uh, that would that s falls within my family. I mean, family could be put in quotes then, rather than meaning it in the narrowest sense. In the family child care quadrant of my two by two table, I would consider grandparents providing. Uh, child care services is also family child care, and fictive kin providing child care services is also family child care. So, uh, yes, and if you add those complexities, there would be additional things we would talk about. So it wouldn't be just parental caregiving leaves. We might want to talk about <coughs> um, kin caregiving leaves. And there are some schemes that allow people to get paid caregiving leaves for, re for people other than their immediate family. You know, so there, there could be other policy things. But those all seem like complexities that don't change the fundamental point. You know, so there's different kinds of complexities in any sociological theoretical discussion. Some kinds of complexities, when introduced, means that you got it wrong in the first place. And therefore, they really are critical. And it may be that the complexity from sexuality has that character. You know, so that's something to really think about. Does adding that complexity really change the way you would even talk about what I did talk about? Other kinds of complexity are important, but they're just an additional thing to talk about and to figure out the implications of, rather than it getting into the core of the original argument. So I, I think this kind of complexity has more of that character. Just a comment on the race, class, gender. We can add a lot of other things to the list. Disabilities, for example. Uh, and, um, and, the, and this concept of lived experience and how they're always intertwined within individual lived experience. And if that's all we were interested in, was the existential lived experience of people, then of course you couldn't talk about their class experience as if it wasn't itself conditioned by their race and gender and disability and other features, because that our lived experiences are integrated and absorbed in our subjectivities and our, and our lives in a way that isn't parsed that way. If, on the other hand, we're talking about these as social causes, as processes that exist that impact the lives of people, then there's no reason why you have to insist that um, they only have their effects by virtue of their intertwining with everything else. If you believe that's the case, and some people do, that class and gender are literally inseparable in their causal processes, not just in their lived experience, then I think the implication is you should have a different concept. You need a concept of what I've referred to as clender. That is, it's not class and it's not gender, it is the interpenetrated combination. There isn't such a thing, class. It does not exist as a mechanism. If its mechanism, its causal processes, can never be separated out from the effects of gender. It's a bit like, I mean, to use the kind of chemistry analog, it's whether you have uh, compounds. The compound water, you don't talk about the effects of hydrogen and the effects of oxygen on a plant when they, you give it water. It's the effects of water. It's a compound. Uh, and we have a way of talking about it, H2O, but it's water's effects on the plant that's the issue. Well, if class and gender are intertwined in that sense, that they don't have separable effects, then we should have a concept of the compound, not the concepts of the separable parts. Well, I don't think anybody actually discusses these things as if that were the case. And therefore, I think it's appropriate to try to isolate, for certain purposes, the gender-specific properties of a phenomenon and the class-specific properties, and then look at their interactions. Thanks very much. Um, I'm Dan Perrins from LSE, and I used to have lunch with Rosemary twice a term next to Market to have a moan about 
everyone and everything, <laughs> and it was very therapeutic, and I miss it a lot. But anyway, mm. the question I wanted to ask was about this caregiving premium in wages and the role of social norms, because I think, in a sense, you didn't quite address... You addressed how changing wages might lead to change in wages, but not actually how the norms would change in the first place to generate those change in, in norms that gave rise to that situation. And I'm not persuaded that it would happen in a socialist society either. Um, so, and yet, the social norms with respect to wages have changed enormously if we think about the rising inequalities and the way that a CEO, I calculated this, would only have to work something like one and a half days a year to earn the annual wage of a childcare worker. So I, ch social norms with respect to wages have changed dramatically, but why not in respect to care? I wondered if you had any thoughts yeah. on that. Carol Walkowitz, University of Warwick. Um, my question was very similar, which was that you, you didn't really spell out the, the relation between gender norms and value, in, rather than values, I mean value in an economic sense or a materialist sense. So it wasn't really clear to me uh, what you were saying about the, the, uh, the, the uh, penalty, the care work penalty, whether that was a reflection you were implying it wasn't a reflection just of gender norms, that it's, it's women that do it. And that whether you need to you know, have your class and capitalist capital hat on to be able to explain right. that. Caregiving is devalued in the market because of its association as women's labor. But it, because it's symbolically connected to women's labor, it turns out to be a penalty even when men do it. That's all that I meant. That even when you control for the sex, let's say, of the recipient of the wage, there's a caregiving penalty. So there is it, one of the main ways that gender is reflect turns into a wage gap between men and women is via the connection between gender and caregiving. And but it becomes a caregiving penalty in the sense that it's applied to both men and women. But it's still a gendered feature of care work that I think that infuses gender with uh, caregiving with that devalued amount. Now, um, <clears throat> how would you get a caregiving premium? Well, it's not going to happen through the market. The market isn't going to give you a caregiving premium. The market gives you a caregiving penalty. It would have to be done through uh, new rules that regulate the way wages are attached to jobs. Uh, and that would be a political question as to whether or not such a policy could get passed. It can't get passed in a neoliberal world because you can't pass legislation that, uh, ass uh, that assesses the appropriate wages for different kinds of work other than whatever the market gives them. Uh, so that's, uh, it's the, and the, the reason I think that a caregiving premium then would have effect on norms is that if certain kinds of work gets paid more, people will come to value it more, normatively. It'll be seen as more valuable. It's not that it's paid, it's paid less because it's thought of as less valuable. If it's paid more, it becomes thought of as more valuable. Uh, Ivan Atanasov, um, devil's advocate, uh, retired. Um, the Beeb, Auntie Beeb has, during the week, said that uh, children who are uh, not breastfed enough, uh, have an intelligence problem. And um, so my, uh, co my concern uh, is that uh, men can't breastfeed. And if they're going to be taking the place of their wives, um, are the children going to be less intelligent at the end of it? Yeah, Adamson, Middlesex University. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, I have a very short comment, which is, it was really great to see the discussion starting with fathers for once, rather than with mothers, um, and what should we do with fathers rather than <laughs> what should we do with mothers. And I found your discussion of the change in behavior and norms of care given in the family very interesting. But then I started thinking, well, how can we, you know, scale up the analysis to the level of organization? Because even though, um, Within the family, we might be changing the roles, but the roles are intimately tied to the workplace roles as well, in the sense that, well, is it appropriate for a man to take 
uh, to go part time, you know, to take more time for childcare, to to take paternal uh, paternity leave, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I, I guess my question is about uh, if you want to scale up these um, behavior changing norms to institutional and organizational level, how would that look like? Um. Yes, there, there's a whole slew of additional transformations that would be needed to create what one might think of as a stable equilibrium of degendered norms in the family. Uh, all sorts of public policies around work-family balance, for example, that would remove what would become a fatherhood penalty. We have mommy tracks. If these kinds of proposals were put into place and nothing changed within workplaces, there'd be daddy tracks, which would also be devalued. And then the issue would be that parents would be disadvantaged compared to non-parents within work. Uh, how in a highly competitive neoliberal world it's possible to transform the internal workings of workplaces in such a way as to prevent that from happening would be, you know, it's obviously extremely difficult. There, I think there would, well, getting rid of the mommy track and turning it into a parent trap, track, uh, is an advantage because the coalition of people who will find that objectionable is bigger than the coalition of people who just find the mommy track objectionable. Uh, but. Yes, it would need significant transformations in the way we think of work um, and the way we put constraints upon the inequalities within workplaces. Uh, one optimistic thing to say about this is that global warming may help feminism because the kind of manic accumulation-driven uh, hyper-competitive consumerism of advanced capitalism is just not on for the next centuries. It's just not possible to sustain the kind of world we have with that kind of economic organization without muting these competitive drives in ways that enable people to shift from a consumption driven to a time, uh, a time available driven sense of well-being. I mean, the, you know, this is a bigger discussion about how to transform a capitalist economy in ways that makes it uh, tameable within the constraints of the environmental crisis. And my view is that um, the kinds of workplace changes that would be needed to reinforce the changes in the domestic sphere and to create the complementarities that would create a better, more egalitarian equilibrium, that those things are not compatible with a freewheeling capitalist economy. Constraints on capitalism sufficient to solve the environmental problem, whether or not you can have any capitalism, or it just has to be a constrained capitalism? That's the kind of debate that I have with Matt Vidal, my former student. Uh, but it certainly can't, nothing approaching this can happen under the current view that the market solves these kinds of problems. Now, on the breastfeeding thing, I mean, it, let's just, it's just it's pretty simple. If it were really true that not being breastfed meant that you'd have significant cognitive deficits, that would be a big problem if it were really true that you'd have big, I wasn't breastfed. Um, <laughs> not that that's proof of anything, but uh, you know, it would be a major problem. If, if it turns out, you know, my hypothesis about these distributions of men and women, you know, way back at the beginning of the, uh, this, this picture here, my hypothesis on the right is that the underlying biological dispositional differences between biological males and females aren't that big. The distributions overlap tremendously in terms of our proclivities for nurturance versus our proclivities for you know, tough-minded aggressiveness or whatever. I think that these distributions overlap tremendously and that the gender gap in caregiving in a degendered world would be small. Well, I could be wrong about that. You know, the, uh, the essentialists could be right. The, the, the essentialists claim that there are essential differences between biological men and women that are big as opposed to tremendously overlapping. That's an empirical claim. It's not a philosophical claim. It's an empirical claim. I think the evidence is that the distributions overlap tremendously, but there's counter evidence. So if it were true 
that you're really damaging your children by not breastfeeding them, then either we have to improve the technologies of breast pumps to make it easier for men to be surrogate breastfeeders, or perhaps even more techno-freaky, techno uh, figure out ways for men to lactate. <laughs> I mean, I tell you, when my babies were little, if, I, if there was a technology in which I could have lactated and breastfed them, I would have done it. <laughs> I mean, I, no, I'm, I'm being serious. Of course, I'm being lighthearted about it, but I'm also being serious about it. And I think a lot of men, a lot of men are very jealous about the forms of intimacy with babies that women have, and I would have wanted to transgress that barrier. Uh, or at least I hope I would have wanted to. This is, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a little older now and wiser maybe than I was 35 years ago. So my, yes, th there are empirical issues here, not philosophical issues, that can become obstacles. But I still think that there are most obstacles rather than determinants of um, the forms of gender division of labor and care work that we observe in the world, and that fundamentally a degendering of these processes is in, we're in the midst of, and that pushing that further is an essential part of any emancipatory project. On that note, um, can I ask you to say another big thank you to our speaker, Eric Olin Mike? <laughs> get up to leave, I would like to say another couple of thank yous. And the first one, and probably the biggest, is to Kate Purcell, who has been really the person who has pushed this seminar, oh, sorry, lecture series forward, um, got the rest of us together, energised us and kept us going when it was more difficult to get it organised. Um, so I would like to thank Kate um, wholeheartedly. <laughs> I'd also like to thank people who've been involved in organising the lecture, both those members of the organising committee who've played a kind of active role, but also from the Department of Sociology at City University. First of all, Jean Chalaby, who was enthusiastic from the off, um, and later Chris Greer, who's been equally enthusiastic and carried on the support of the department. Um, I'd like to thank at the BSA, especially um, the ex-president John Holmwood, who has been very supportive, and Alison Danforth, who's done a lot of on-the-ground sort of work with the BSA and getting their support um, together. And at Work, Employment and Society, both the former editors, um, Irina Grugillis and Mark Stewart, and the current editors, um, Mel Sims, um, Andy Danford, and the rest of the team from Leicester, many of whom are here, um, have been really, really supportive and have helped us to get this seminar series, sorry, lecture series, um, to where it is now. I'd also like to thank all of you for coming and making this a really great event. Um, I'd like to encourage those of you who didn't register in advance to register so we can let you know about next year's lecture, um, which we've got ideas about who is coming, but we haven't got a firm name yet, but we hope it will be someone if not equally, almost as exciting as Eric Wright. Um, and finally, the other thing I wanted to ask you to do, and this is where my begging hat comes on, is we have funding at the moment from the Department of Sociology at City, from WES and the BSA, and that's guaranteed for the next three years. But we want this annual series to continue beyond the next three years. And as many of us know, universities and um, academic funding is somewhat precarious at times. So we are encouraging those of you who knew and worked with Rosemary who would like to see this seminar continue to think about donating. There are donation forms outside. <laughs> they are on the same desk that you registered. You can also do it online, but you know, you might forget. So please think about doing it before you leave. If it's 10 pounds, that's great. If you're rich, you know, some of the professoriate who are living in villas in the south of France, that's you do. Um, you know, perhaps a little more. Um, but yes, please do think about that. And thanks again, everybody, for coming. Thank you.